Walter Peter, welcome to the podcast. How's it going today? Yeah, pretty pretty good. It's early and um, it looks like it's going to be the hottest day of the year here in Sydney. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how I survive. Yeah. <laughs> how about you, Etienne? How are you? How are you going? The coldest day of the year. We have like, like snow and everything, so very different. <laughs> but uh, Montreal, yeah. Yeah. Right. That's all right. Yeah. Cool. So tell us what's going on these days a little bit in your life. Um, well, for me, I've been maybe the last three years, I've been focusing a lot on uh, looking at risk. So the management of risk and the other side of that coin, which is sort of the psychology of trading. So those have been my, um, my foci for the last three years, I'd say. It's been a big deal and um, what, I've, what I've really been getting into. So it's kind of interesting because the, the more like you can tell where someone is as a trader by the questions they ask, you know, and I tend to believe that as you get further on the on the path, you you focus more on the psychology um, and risk that sort of, you know, in the beginning, it's all about the systems and then later on, it becomes the risk and psychology. And that's, that's definitely been my where I'm at right now is looking at, at that like different ways to to use risk and different ways to try and help yourself from a psychological point of view really yeah that's really interesting because i know you more maybe as someone focused on systems and price action so it's interesting right. that you kind of went into different topic as well but we'll talk about all of those for sure to be very interesting okay. i want to know first though how did you start to trade exactly and when was that um, so this was in 2000, the year 2000, I was, so quick background. So I, I, uh, wanted to become a psychologist and I did a PhD in experimental psychology and I wanted to become a jury consultant, which is kind of a, well, it's a, it's a relatively well-known profession in the United States. Um, what may or may not be known was, well, at least when I did this back in, uh, 99, 1999, 2000, it was, you know, there were probably a couple hundred in the United States and that's about it. So it was a very difficult job to get, but that's what I wanted to do. And it was my dream job. And I, and I, and I, I finally made it happen after I graduated from graduate school and I had this job as a jury consultant. And what I didn't realize about being a jury consultant is you travel all the time. So you, you spend a lot of weekends in hotels in cities far away from where you live. And I didn't like that. Because I, I enjoyed surfing and I felt like, you know, I had a, a, a very small window in the morning to go surfing and then they were taking my weekends away to go surfing. So I was really upset about that. And although I liked the job, I didn't like work wearing suits and, you know, living out of hotels, you know, far away from California where I was from. So um, my friend contacted me in 2000 and he said, he said, you should learn about this, this currency trading thing. And I said, really? I said, it didn't really sound very cool because I was used to being the guy at the party when people would say, hey, so what do you do? This, by the way, this is back in the dot-com bubble and I was living in San Francisco and the, you know, a lot of people were happy that they were working at a dot-com. And so I, was, I thought it was pretty cool, my job, when I explained it to people and people were like, oh, that's, that's fascinating. So you helped pick the jury for you know, high stakes trials. I was like, yeah, you know, I thought it was a pretty cool job. Well, I, it wasn't that cool, really, when I when I worked out how much free time I had, which was basically none. <laughs> so um, when my friend said, you should learn this currency trading thing, I said, yeah. And he told me about a book. There was one book on currency trading, and I read it, and I, I had to admit, I didn't really understand much of it because it was really um, um, convoluted. And then at the end of the book, they had this GAN chart with all these GAN numbers, which was really weird because he didn't talk about GAN in the book at all. <laughs> but wow. at the end of the book in the appendix it had all these GAN numbers and everything. It was weird. So I, I didn't really get much out of the book, but he showed me how to find the charts. And eventually he convinced me to quit my dream job and move, move to where he lived. Uh, and, and then he said, go and take this course. And, I, and that's how I learned really is I took this course. It was a week-long course. And what they did was they t teach you technical analysis and they wanted you to open an account through them. So they were kind of like an introducing broker. And you have to under understand, back then, the charts were delayed. So just as you had stock charts that were delayed, the currency charts were delayed. So we didn't really know what the price was. If you logged into an online platform, which uh, uh, at the time there were two companies that we could find that had online Forex platforms, and you could get the real price there. But if you didn't have a live account, uh, 
you know, you, you, you couldn't get free charts that had like the real price of the euro, for example. So what they wanted you to do was learn how to trade through the company, open an account through the company, and then um, go to the office and trade there, right? And they and it, it was like a 28 pip spread, and you couldn't actually make the trade on the on your computer. They had workstations there. You had to go run to what they called the cage and tell the lady that you were gonna that you wanted a euro quote, and she would quote you whatever. Well, she would call Hong Kong, and she'd get a quote, and she would quote you what the the euro was, and you could take a trade there. And we were mostly trading the euro and a little bit Swiss because Swiss franc because. Um, those were the easiest pairs to trade, you know, through the company. But that was kind of my introduction to trading. And um, it it was interesting because I talked to some of the people that were there and and it didn't seem like anybody was making money, you know, at the office. And then um, we decided to go and do it our, ourselves. So my friend and I opened up an online account. Like I said, this was just beginning. And we tripled our money the first night. And then by, so that was like Tuesday night or whatever. And then by Friday, we were broke. <laughs> so that was my introduction to Forex. <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. And was that enough for you to become profitable? Or I guess not, because you didn't, you blow up an account. No. So what did you have to do after that to become profitable? No, so my friend had made friends. He, he, had, um, he had a Swedish girlfriend and he spoke Swedish. And he, he had met this really famous Swedish guy. Apparently, according to his girlfriend, this guy was the Swedish Bill Gates. And so the Swedish Bill Gates told us if we could make money trading Forex, he would give us a big pile of money to trade. And he was legit. Like, he was a real dude. You know, we looked him up and we went to his offices and all that. He had several companies. Um, but what was interesting is September 11th happened, which was terrible for, you know, everyone, especially people in the U.S. And, and not only was it just a, a weird time to be alive, but it was also... Um, companies were wiped out. So liquidity was gone. There was, no, there was no credit. And he lost a few companies. And at that point, he said, look, guys, we're not going to go through with this. And thank God he didn't because we would have lost his money because <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing, right? We had no idea what we were doing. And um, it took me, after that time learning about Forex, I spent the next four and a half years the last year and a half I spent in Australia, but the first three years or so was in the U.S. and I was just learning as much as I could. I read all about technical analysis. I learned all I could. It was mostly through technical analysis books for stock traders. And um, when I got to Australia, I really concentrated on it. I just took a sabbatical. And it was where when I got to Australia that I figured it out. Um, I found a book called The Encyclopedia of Chart Part Patterns by... Um, Bulkowski, Thomas Bulkowski, and that was really what did it for me. And and then when Forex Trader or not Forex Trader, when uh, Forex Tester came around a few years later, then it was like, ah, okay, this was cool because I could take the patterns that I learned in Bulkowski's books, and I could see if they would work in Forex. And of course, you start to tweak them a little bit and use slightly different entries and things like that. But that's basically how. I made the leap. It wasn't until I actually got to the point where I was using very simple price patterns that I had built up confidence in by testing them in Forex Tester that I was actually making money. So that was four and a half years. And was it enough to go full time then? Or did you still have some things put in place? Well, um, well, I did have a job as a Forex trader for a guy in New York. And um, this was right about the time when I started becoming profitable. And what he wanted me to do was trade a lot because he made money ev on every transaction. And he was like, Meh, it's okay if your accounts don't really go up as long as you're trading a lot. And I had worked out at that stage when I become profitable that I didn't want to trade the one hour or the 15 minute charts. I really wanted to trade the daily charts and maybe the four hour charts and the weekly charts. And so I wasn't trading often enough for him. So I was making money and I was a full-time trader technically because I was working for this guy. Uh, I think they gave us they gave us a big chunk of the commissions on every trade, and then they gave us like nine percent of the profits, something like that. But he started getting upset with me because I wasn't making enough money for him because I wasn't taking enough trades. Um, and about that time, I ran into some visa issues, so I so I basically had to get a job in Australia. So he dropped me. Uh, we parted ways. I wasn't a 
true forex trader anymore. And I was just trading on the side with a job. And then once I was able to live in Australia without you know, visa issues, then that's when I made the break as a full-time trader. So it still took another you know, it was four and a half years to get profitable. And then another two years before I actually left. And one thing I would say to people listening to this, if you're thinking of making the jump, just build up a nice nest egg so that you can live for the next 12 months and you don't have that pressure of trying to make money every single week, every single month. And when, you know, when the trades aren't there, that's what I would suggest to people who are thinking about making that jump. Because the biggest mistake people make is they think, oh, I missed that trade. If I was trading full time, I would have, you know, had that trade. I would have made that trade. And because I'm not trading full time, I miss out on too many opportunities. So I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to start trading. It's much easier to do that once you have that little nest egg built up so that you know you don't have to trade. Um, I found the biggest difficulties when I left my job and started trading full time because I, I, I tended to over trade or over manage my trades and I wasn't doing that when I had my job. So that's, that's a thing that you have to be aware, wary of that you, know, you, you get this a big chunk of pressure on your shoulders when you, when you feel like, oh, I really need to make this work. I really need to find an opportunity today. And some, some days there aren't any opportunities and you just have to walk away. Mm -hmm. And especially when you trade a higher time frame like you do, and like I do kind of, but I don't trade as high as you do, I think. So I'm going to trade on the forward chart and the daily chart most of the time. And I think you trade even on the, the weekly chart, which is even more. And those setups don't come too often necessarily. So, Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously, as you know, Etienne, it depends on your your systems. Like if you're trading, you know, yeah. 30 systems or two systems or whatever, right? And how often they've trade. But yeah. but yeah, but yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And it's one of those things that I think it's interesting because you, I think it's one of those things you have to learn as a trader because it when you're trading the lower time frame, you're a, it's a different area of your brain that you're using, right? It's the same area of your brain that you're using when you're when you're gambling, for example. Uh, but when you're trading a daily chart, it's the kind of area of your brain that you use when you're like building a bridge. <laughs> so everything's kind of planned out. It's a different, it's a totally different experience. And, and that's another thing I think that runs, that a lot of traders run into is they feel like if they trade the five minute charts, they'll be able to grow their account much quickly, much more quickly. And that's certainly true, but you also have to deal with the fact that you're, you're operating basically in your gambling brain <laughs> and the same brain that, you know, is responsible for, you know, addiction to drugs and things like that. So you have to be really careful when you do that. So that's that's another trap I think that some traders fall into. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you'll be probably trading like five hours a day to make the same amount of money if you go to day yeah. trade. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, and people, yeah, people think, yeah, exactly. I, I know some successful traders who trade, uh, you know, scalping style, mm -hmm. but they all have one thing in common, which is they limit their... Um, their time of the day to trade, it's like I'm going to work and I'm punching out. And it's usually a very, it's not a lot of hours. They also take big breaks. So there'll, there'll be whole months of the year where they don't trade at all. And they're extremely disciplined. And if you don't have those three things, if you're not disciplined, if you're not focused in, a, in a, just a small time period, like maybe you just trade the two hours before and after the New York session opens, for example. That's the kind of thing that scalpers do, successful scalpers do. And they'll take like three or four months off and just, just relax. And if, you, if you're unable to do those things, my experience tells me that you're probably not going to be doing well as a scalper. But you know, it, it could, I could be wrong, right? But those are the things that I notice are continually the characteristics of successful scalpers. So it's a difficult thing to do, I think, for most people, but some people can. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the reasons why you got into trading was to have more freedom and not be able to not not have to work all day at your desk and whatever. So that's that's something you have to look at. Also, I think really important. Yeah, take breaks. Just make sure you, you give yourself breaks. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Did your trading style evolve since you wrote Naked Forex, or did that stay pretty much the same? Um, it's funny you say that. It it has evolved. Uh, there are systems that are not in the Naked Forex book that I use a lot. And um, so I'm going to write another book on, on systems. Uh, and, 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 you know, people that follow my trades know how I trade. But 
for those that have just read the book, there'll be another book coming out that will have the newer systems that I'm trading. Very, very similar in some ways, but different reasons for taking the trades. And um, but but like I said, my main focus right now is psychology and risk, which is why the first book I'm going to write next is the psychology book. Really, that's my that's my focus right now. And when that's done, then I'll go back into another you know, naked fork style book with systems and things like that. Cause I know people like that stuff. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what, what made the shift for you to go from more like systems to psychology? Was it like a, a shift or was it just kind of a natural transition over time? Well, I think it's, I think it's a natural transition. I think, like I say, you can, you can tell where someone's at by the, by what they're interested in the questions they ask You can tell where they're at, because what happens is, you get to a certain point where you're trading your system and you know your system is probably going to work in the future. Mm -hmm. And then it all, it becomes this, this, how far can I push it? How can I, how far can I put press my risk? How, you know, what can I do with risk management? Uh, and um, that's where traders get into trouble is they, 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 they misunderstand risk and they believe that to make more money, they can simply add more risk per position. What this does is it makes it more likely that they're going to hit their catastrophic drawdown level. Now, I don't know what your catastrophic drawdown level is or whoever's listening to this. I don't know what that number is. For some traders, it's 10%. For other traders, it's 30%. But at some point, you're going to decide that the system is broken or that the market has changed. And that's usually not the case for either of those. <laughs> so in both cases, we're wrong, right? And what we think is, oh, the market's changed, or my system's broken. But really what's happened is you've set your trading to a risk level where it's, it's unavoidable. You're going to hit that, that drawdown level that's going to make you rethink things. And sometimes that means you tweak your system, you add a filter or something crazy like that. Or other times you just quit trading the system altogether or quit, quit trading altogether. And it really has nothing to do with the system or the market. It's just that you've decided to, to put that risk at a level where you're, you're definitely going to hit that, that uncle point, that point where you just say, ah, I can't take it anymore. And I, and I feel like, you know, once traders get a grasp of this, this concept of what's the risk of my drawdown, of my max drawdown, they, they can do a lot better. And the other thing they have to get a, a, a handle on is, you know, how do I figure out a way to make sure that I execute my strategy over and over again the right way? And that really comes down to psychology and focusing on not the results of your trades, but the process of taking your trades. That's really where the secret is. It's not thinking about what, what happened last time and why I should change my next trade. It really comes down to um, what, what can I do so that I get to the point where all I'm focused on is executing the trade the right way. And what that means is you're going to be really happy when you have trades that are losers. And I know it sounds weird, but because you've done it the right way, you've executed your system the right way, you should be rewarding yourself, even though you had a loser. And it's counterintuitive because we're always looking to fix things and reasons why we had four losers in a row and things like that. But that's not really the way that, in my estimation and in my experience, the best traders look at it. They look at process, they look at execution, and they don't focus on results. Yeah, and this is probably the biggest shift I've made myself in my trading, to shift from the outcome to being addicted to the process. And that makes yeah. a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And you, and you use the right term too when you say addicted because you can be addicted to that dopamine hit that you get uh, when you reward yourself, right? I mean, we know this, like in, um, you know, those fitness, like Apple Watch or mm -hmm. those fitness, those Fitbit things. And like, what, what is that? That's the gamification of exercise, right? So when I had, I don't wear it anymore, but when I had one of those things, I used to always be looking at how many steps I take today. And I would, you know, I don't like to drive anyway, so I'd walk everywhere, right? And I say, oh yeah, I hit my 20,000 steps or whatever, you know? And it was like, I didn't even really care about the fact that I was walking a lot. All I really cared about was hitting my, you know, getting that, yeah. that win and getting, hitting those levels. And that's the same thing you can do with your trading because that dopamine hit you get comes from executing, not from winning. And that's, once you do that, as you say, it's a bit, makes a big difference, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. How do you transfer that to trading? Do you look at the, like a compliance percentage level that you have to reach or how do you transfer the Fitbit aspect of trading? Well, what I do, and I, what I recommend that people do, 
is all you really have to do is keep like a journal. And what you do is you, you, you give yourself a score on your entry of your trade. So you don't know, there's no hindsight bias here because you don't know what's going to happen in the end, right? And obviously my trades usually take some time. So this is quite easy to do for a trader who trades four hour or daily charts or weekly charts. So you give yourself a score, okay, in the, on the entry. And then you give yourself a score when the trade's over on the exit. And then what you do is you add those scores together. And if it hits a certain level, you get a point for that or two points or whatever. You know, you make a game out of it. And then when you get enough points, you reward yourself. You go to the movies, you go on a holiday. You know, you could just go on a weekend holiday with your girlfriend or your wife or, or whatever, your husband, whatever. Um, and then when you get enough points, you can buy yourself something really nice. Like I like to get myself um, really expensive surfboards. You know, these are the sorts of things that you do. You're making a game out of it. Really, that's what it comes down to is like, how can I create a system so that I get rewarded with a dopamine hit when I do the right thing, win or lose, and then I keep striving to do to do that. And that's the best thing I've come up with. If anyone else has a better idea, let me know. But it's basically like the Fitbit watch for traders. You just keep track of how you're doing, not of your wins and losses, of your execution. And then in the end, you keep rewarding yourself and you build up to bigger and bigger rewards over time. Love it. See, I had a way of doing it, but I think this one's much better. So 10 times better, I'll probably use it. Okay, great. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious to know how do you now going back to systems a little bit. I know a lot of people try to trade higher time frame when they try to use only price action. What do you think are the mistake they make when they try to look only at price action? When they look at only price action? Yeah. Um well, I mean, the biggest mistake people make is they they think that they can't trade it because their account's too small. Um, yeah. But you can move to a broker, obviously, that the, the, a broker that will allow you to take really small lot sizes. So that that's not really a, a problem. But people think it's a problem. Um, the other issue, I think, is you don't look at context. So I'll give an example. Um, I might have, let's say I, I'm watching the uh, pound USD go up. And I might have a situation where it looks like that the pound is going to reverse because it throws up like a kangaroo tail, which is one of the classic naked forex reversal signals. But if I look at the overall context, what I'll notice is that, you know, out of the last eight candles, the market has hit resistance three times. And this third time that it's hit resistance, it's thrown up this beautiful looking kangaroo tail. Well, that actually may not be such a good sell signal. That actually might be um, a breakout that's happening because it keeps hitting resistance and it's hit resistance repeatedly over successive um, candles. And so that's one thing that I look at and I think a lot of traders, they just look at the signal in isolation and they don't look at the overall context of the chart. I think that's one area. The other area that I, I'm a big fan of and I've and this will be in the new uh, Naked Forex book, is looking at what the retail traders are doing. I think you can get a huge edge by knowing what other retail traders are doing. And of course, the secret is that you do what, they, what they're not doing. <laughs> so if like 77% of the retail traders are selling the pound USD, then I know that it's in an uptrend and I want to be buying, that sort of thing. Uh, but so you can overlay that on naked Forex patterns too. So, but I, I think the biggest mistake, if I had to say it, would be not looking at context, not looking at the overall picture and just focusing on one or two candles, which isn't, is, in my estimation, in my experience, that, that doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. And this is really how I started to trade price action to look only at candlesticks and like maybe you set up in your book as well. And then later on, I added the, con the context with like looking at the zones and everything that make that also made a big difference for me. So, yeah. And I got yep. that from your book as well. So, oh, well, great. That's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm just curious because this is a little bit not clear to me. How do you look at what the majority of people are doing? Is it something you kind of know by habit or is it something you have to look for somewhere? Yeah, yeah, I can send you links if you want to put them in the show notes, but yeah. there, there are several out there. Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to send you links. So what you do, um, different brokers will offer it. So obviously you don't know what all the retail traders are doing. You just know what they're doing at your broker or you know, at a broker in particular. And people get confused. They think, well, if all the trade, like 80% of the traders are selling pound USD, then the pound USD is going to go down, right? And the answer is no. Remember, uh, retail traders are... are 
by and large losers. They don't, they don't make money, which is, which is weird because they actually win more often than they lose. We know from a, a long-term study with millions of trades of retail traders, and I can send you the link for this too, that retail traders actually have a, a, pause, like a higher win rate. So they win, I don't know what it is, 57% of the time or something like that. The problem is their losers are much bigger than their winners, right? And so when we know that the retail traders are all in on one side, like to use the example that's been, that I've been using here is everyone's selling pound USD. If I look at the chart and it's going up, the, the pound USD is going up and I see that you know 80% of retail traders are selling pound USD, all I'm looking for now is a naked pattern, a naked forex pattern that says buy pound USD. And as soon as I get it, I'm in because I know that the retail traders are wrong. They are, they're always looking to sell in a strong, trend, a strong uptrend and buy in a strong downtrend. That's always been the case. So it's, it's really only in a specific instance, which is really trend trading that I use the retail numbers, but many, many brokers offer beautiful data. And this is actually an empirical question. You don't, ha you know, like you don't have to, you might be thinking right now, listening to this thinking, no, that doesn't make sense. Why would it go the other way? Well, you can actually look at the data. You can compare historical price to the, what's called the open position ratios and see that this is almost always the case. When retail traders all pile in on one, on one side, it usually means that the, tr the strong trend is gonna keep going. And so I find it to be a, a very valuable tool for you know, just kind of overlaying on, uh, it's not, you can't use it, I don't think, by itself. Yeah. But if you have a system, uh, in particular, a, a trend trading system like the trendy kangaroo tails that I use, it's really great, it really is cool. And is, is it something you would be able to backtest or because can you have the data for like the past five years or whatever to backtest? Yep, yep. There, so there are, um, I think it's uh, actually a friend of mine, uh, a trader I work with, he's, uh, you know, he works for a famous um, worldwide hedge fund and he, he's into programming stuff. And, and he asked, asked me the same question. I showed him, I said, yeah, you can actually download the data. Now, I don't know how far, I think it only goes back about a year but you can obviously collect it over years or something. And maybe you can even contact this broker uh, and I'll send you the link for that so that people get that in the show notes. But you know, you can definitely, he's basically working on that question is what I'm saying. He's, he's taking that, that, that idea, which is okay, can I take these data and look at something? And yeah, and I think he might even be trying to create some sort of indicator or something, I don't know. But yeah, so that's, but you can definitely go back, scroll back and say, okay, every time that you know, only 30% of the traders are um, buying. Um, so if 30, like if 30% of the traders are buying the pound, so it means 70% are selling the pound, you can see what happens with the pound, you know, and you can see that it goes up. So it compares the ratio of open positions to price as it goes up and down. So you can definitely see that, but I think it only goes back a year. Okay, cool. And one of the things I'm kind of struggling with a little bit with higher time frame, and this is like this is something I'm working on and I'm maybe kind of out of it soon, but it's the idea that if you trade only a few things, your drawdowns are going to be bigger and it's going to take more time for you to, to recover, like maybe months or like at least a few weeks to recover. So how have you deal with this? Have you implemented more strategies, more setups to be able to kind of combine things together? Yeah, more strategies and more setups. Um, uh, the the more markets thing is overrated though. I think what you'll find, and the, there's data to support this, is if you trade more markets, um, the markets are fairly correlated. You're better off trading complementary systems. So like a trend trading system and a swing trading system or something like that, a breakout system and a reversion to the mean system or something like that. But yeah, the other thing that you can do, which I find to be useful, and again, you know, people say, why do you work with traders? Why don't you just trade on your own? Well, one, trading is very lonely. It's boring. <laughs> yeah, it's boring. And two, um, I've learned some really cool things from my students. So it works both ways. And one of the things I've learned is that it makes sense to break up your trade. So let's say, for example, you're taking a trade and you typically risk 2% on the trade. Well, and, and you have a, a trailing exit that gets you out of the trade, all right? Well, let's say that you take that same trade and you break it up into four. One trade has a hard target of, uh, say, three R, so three times your risk. Another one is the typical trailing exit that you normally use. 
Another one might be one where you actually pyramid into it. So as the trade gets closer and closer to a target, you add more positions and maybe you keep moving it to break even. So it, if it comes back and retraces against you, you get popped out of that position at break even. But if it keeps accelerating towards your target, you make a whole bunch on that on that one quarter of of the trade, which is you know 0.5% risk. And then on another one, you might have a really easy to achieve target. So instead of you know three. 3R, three, three times your risk, you might have 1.5 times your risk or something like that. So just that concept of taking the same trade, the, the same signal, but instead of just putting everything on one exit strategy, you, you split it up into four different exits. That thing can help too. That's a, that's a very powerful idea. If you, you can go and test that and see what wor- you know, if that will work for you. But typically, it's really cool because you think about it, you're, you're at that point where, oh, okay, um, if the market keeps going really fast for me, then my pyramiding position is going to make me money. Um, and if it doesn't, that's okay. It comes back out and stops me out. But if everything totally falls apart, I still get the same loss that I've been having. It's just I have more opportunity to be right. And you're always going to be right when you split it up in four positions like this. One of them is always going to be the right decision, right? So you don't have to second guess yourself because you get to be right almost every time. Now, of course, when you lose, all four positions are, are are wrong too, and you're wrong. But that doesn't really matter because that was the original risk you had on anyway with, with a normal trade. So yeah, that's one thing that can work quite a bit is is allowing yourself different exit strategies even on the same position. Very insightful. I love it. Love it. That's going to be really useful, I think. And. I think you're kind of in the same boat where you like to travel and trade. And this is something I got addicted to like in the past year. So how do you handle this to be able to travel and trade at the same time? Because I've seen some challenges for sure. And I've overcome a lot of them. But what are some things that you do maybe to make it easier? Yeah, well, um, one is you, you go, you've got to like if you go someplace continually, you can get... Um, like those those travel modems you know so like if like if i if i go to the united kingdom a lot or italy you just make sure that you have a modem for that country right and it's like a prepaid so you can just keep topping up so like if you rent a house in italy it's the house is going to have internet right but in case it goes down or in case you're some you know you're you're someplace and you you want to check your trade having those travel modems those prepaid travel modems is gold i have i have them for many different countries so so wherever you go somewhere you make sure that you can put credit on it and you've got your internet connection the other thing is it's okay to pair it back and not trade the 4 hour when you're on holiday like if you're in in europe and you're having a holiday maybe it makes sense to just keep and that's not that difficult. Um, so I, I really like making, I, I just feel comfort, comfortable when I have, when I know I have internet and I know that if the internet in the rental house goes out, I've got my prepaid modem. I really like that. And I also like the idea of just sticking to daily and weeklies when I'm, when I'm traveling. I actually like traveling to Europe because Europe is uh, obviously the the London Open and that's when a lot of my trades trigger is London Open or New York Open so it's in the middle of the day in Europe that's great because here in Australia I have the days open with the Asian session and then the London Open starts in the early evening hours um, which which is fine it just means when I when I'm in Europe I just have to make sure that I you know that I'm aware that when I wake up I should probably see if the trades have been triggered that's all um, you know it's the other thing you can do is automation. So you can have scripts or EAs that will move your stops to break even for you. So you don't actually have to do that manually. And that's a good idea too, if that's the way that you trade. Um, and you're worried about not being able to do that when you're on a flight or something. Some flights actually have internet now. So that's really good. Obviously, all airports have internet. So if you're in, in an airport, it's quite easy to manage trades. Um, and then the other thing is, just know what's going to happen when you get there. Like if I'm going to Vancouver um, in Canada, for example, that's a terrible time zone. Um, (laughs) So I just have to be aware that, you know, um, a lot of the trade action is going to happen when I'm sleeping, right? So that, you know, you just have to be aware of when, when is this stuff going to be when are your trades going to be triggered uh, and what time of the day is that going to be where you're at and and that sort of thing. But I think if you just pull back a bit, trade the higher time frames, use some move to break even scripts, have the travel modem. Those are the kinds of things that I use. Uh, I used to, you know, 
eight years ago, I used to um, have to find internet cafes, but you don't have to do that anymore. With the, with the, the prepaid modems, you, yeah. you can pretty much be set anywhere. So, yeah. It's interesting because I thought that you were more focused on looking at the chart only once a day or maybe twice a day. So what I see is that you have kind of a mix between managing your trades and looking at new setups. How does that work out in your schedule? Do you look at the chart multiple times? or? No, I just look at the chart. So if I'm in Australia, I just look at the chart in the morning. So like now, basically, when, as we're recording this. And I will decide whether or not I'm going to take a trade in the evening when the London market fires up. Uh, and if I'm in Europe, it's the same thing. I would look at the charts in the evening before I went to sleep because that's sort of the Asian session. And if there's, if there's anything that looks good there, then I would um, wake up in the morning early and make sure that my trades are, are you know, my, my orders are put in. So it, you can still do it twice a day. The biggest deal, I think, is when people are in a trade and they're on holidays and then it turns into a loser. And, they, you know, at least for me, that's, that's not very nice when you could have moved to break even. So having, having scripts for, for moving to break even is the biggest deal for me. Um, that's where, where I find the most value really for, for uh, you know, automation is, is removing that risk that's still there in an open trade. Uh, so that's, that's how I do it. I still only look at the charts twice a day. So for example, let's say I look at the charts during the Asian session um, and I say, oh, well, that looks like that's potentially going to be a really good trade when London comes in. And then if I go to London on the London Open and it's totally different, like Asia did something way different than I thought it would, then I just won't take the trade. So it still basically is a look and a decision. And then you just follow up and just make sure that everything looks right when you put it in the platform. That's how I do it. So it's basically twice a day. Mm -hmm. And is there a reason to wait for London to open to place your trades or wouldn't you be able to place just uh, an entry order right away? Yeah, that's a great question. If I lived in some place like um, New York, I would do that. I would do that. Right when I went to bed, I would put in my order because obviously London's going to open in the middle of the night and you know I'm going to miss it. So I would wait as long as possible to... You know, maybe I might go to bed at like 11.30 p.m. and then put my order in, right? Something like that. And, and here's the reason why. It's a great question. So what I've found and what many of my students have found who've run through the data is that we know that our daily chart trades are, most of our losers occur on Mondays and Fridays. So we don't trade daily charts on Mondays and Fridays. The other thing we know is that typically if you have a daily chart signal, what you're going to find is that your if your entry is taken during the Asian session, it also increases the chances of a loser. And so this is what we call the Asian drift, where the, the market tends to go, not always, but tends to kind of slowly move against the move that will later come in either during the London Open or the New York Open. So all I'm really looking for, if I see a trade signal on the daily charts during the Asia session, all I'm really looking for when Asia's over and London's firing up, Frankfurt's on, happen, Frankfurt's open, London's starting to open. All I'm looking for is just the confirmation that the Asian market didn't do something drastic. Something drastic would be if it went strongly in the direction that I expect it to go. So if, I, if I'm buying Euro USD and I see Asia just takes Euro, Euro USD up 80 pips or something crazy like that, then I know I say, okay, something's wrong here. I'm not going to take the trade. It's gone way too far. Um, and it's likely actually to reverse either, if not during London, maybe during New York session. So that's the only reason why I, I would wait um, is, is to make sure that, that the Asian drift sort of does what I expect it to do. So I'm always looking for the market to go down if I'm going to buy and I'm, during Asia. So it's, it should go down during Asia. And if I'm going to sell, I always look for the Asian market to, to, to go up slightly. And the same thing is the case for Mondays and Fridays. If I'm looking to take a weekly chart trade, I'll take that trade on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Why? Because I know that it's likely to go against that trade on Mondays. So that's basically how we do it. Cool. Interesting. I, I think that's invaluable advice. I think that's something that people don't think about necessarily, but that they could apply and see result, which is really, really good. Is there anything else you want to pass on to people that you have to kind of learn or master that they really need to focus on? Uh, well, the biggest thing I think is that Trading is actually very simple. Pro profitable trading is actually very simple. 
Notice I didn't say it was easy, but it is simple because there are two things. You have to have a positive expectancy system, which I think most traders probably understand how to work out the expectancy for their, their trading system. You need the win rate, the average winner, and the average loser, and you can work out your expectancy. And the other thing you need to do is you need to, to execute it, which is you. So there's you and there's the system. Now what happens typically is that traders can find valuable, profitable, positive expectancy systems, but they're unable to find those um, a, a method for focusing on execution and making sure that their psychology is, is correct. And so that's why, you know, the game thing that I shared with you, that's very valuable. Also, the other thing that's interesting is that we have these subconscious beliefs and subconscious thoughts that we're, we're not really aware of. Um, the advertisers that advertise to you are aware of them. <laughs> uh, and they are, they are used. Um, when I was in graduate school, they, they had us teach um, courses in psychology because it's cheaper to have a graduate student teach it than to have a, a professor, obviously. <laughs> and so um, my favorite week of the year for the introductory to psychology course was when we talked about subliminal advertising and we showed all these examples and it, bl it blows people away. Well, you can actually use that to your advantage. And if you have this trading system down, right? And it's working for you and you know it's a positive expectancy system and in all likelihood it's probably going to continue in the future. You never know for sure, right? What's going to happen in the future. But you think it's going to. It's very simple. It doesn't have too many moving parts. It's probably robust enough to work in the future. Well, if that's the case and you're not making money, then it has to be the second piece, which is you. And this is very common. All of us have these subconscious beliefs. So what I would say is look at what these are and here's here's a simple way to find out what is your subconscious belief how, how is this possibly working against your trading um go someplace where you can just sit down on a bench um you know it would be really great if you could do this like near like a um a ferrari dealership or uh you know some like if, if you're in los angeles you can go down to Rodeo Drive and, and, and do this or something like that, but some place where you know you're going to run into some wealthy people. And what I would encourage you to do is just to sit down there and watch as people walk by and listen to your inner voice. Listen to what you're, you're saying um, about those other people that you have. You don't know who they are. They're a blank slate. And what you're doing is you're projecting your thoughts about yourself onto other people. So if you, for example, see the guy walk out of the Ferrari dealership and say, you know, oh, wow, I wonder how many guys he had to screw to make enough money to buy a Ferrari. You know, what, <laughs> what that's saying is that you think that people who have money have to screw someone over to make money, right? That's your subconscious belief, right? So you have to work against, you have to, you have to overcome that challenge. That's a challenge for you, a, a belief that you, that you hold about wealthy people. So these are the sorts of things that people, I think, don't think about. They think all, everything is about the system. All the books, all the courses, everything is about the system. But the other really important piece is you. And if you don't get you right, then you can run into some really difficult um, things. Like if, if you have a trading system, you know it makes money, but you keep, making the same mistake. You keep moving the stop too far away to give the trade more room, or you keep taking profit too early, even though you know what the system is and what you should be doing. That's a subconscious belief, which is changing the way that you execute your strategy. So there are ways that you can overcome subconscious beliefs like that. A really simple one is just to call your local hypnotherapist. Now, they're, they're usually going to talk to uh, people who want to quit smoking and people want to lose weight. That's the most likely person that they have. But if you call your local hypnotherapist and you tell them, look, this is my trading issue. This is what's been going on. And I just, I would like to fix this. I keep, I keep taking profits too early, right? For example, you can go to your hypnotherapist and they can do a session for you. Oftentimes they can record it for you. So you get the recording and then you can listen to it every day. You can also go to your hypnotherapist and say, look, I think I have these real issues about wealth and accumulating money. And so I would like to overcome this issue. Well, um, let's say you've done the park bench experiment and you found that this is the case, right? It's pretty common. So you go and do that. You go and do your hypnotherapy session. You get the recording and you listen to it every night before you go to sleep. This is a really easy way to start putting really positive subconscious beliefs into your mind. And I think that's something that a lot of traders don't look at until, you know, they've been doing this a long time. So that's another thing that I would suggest. That's really interesting. And I didn't see any link between trading and infotherapist, but that seems really convincing. So I like it. Yeah. 
I know, I know a lot of, I actually know a lot of traders, at least three off the top of my head that are students of mine that are also like certified hypnotherapists, which is like crazy, right? But yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen how much even like traders in the institution can have their own coach or psychologist or whatever to help them uh, get on the right track. And that's, mm, the, yeah, that explains everything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just a performance sport. I mean, training is just a performance sport like tennis or golf or whatever. That's all it really is. It, again, it comes down to, you know, execution, just sticking to the process, as you know, as you've discovered yourself, as you know, it's all about the process. And, and the results, you know, the results, it's random. If you have a bad trade, this is the thing I like to tell people, like, um, what's the, I ask people, I say, What's the reason why that, that last trade lost money? What are the reasons? And then everyone, you know, we write all the reasons up on the, on the whiteboard or whatever, right? Well, really, there should only be one reason. And the reason is bad luck, okay? If a trade loses money, it should just be bad luck. If you've executed the strategy, right, as you should, then some are winners, some are losers, and this one ends up in the bad luck loser category. That's it. it sh there should be no other reason other than that. So there's no reason to fix your strategy. There's no reason to, to, to adjust your trading system because the last trade or the last seven trades were losers. There really isn't. It should just be a run of bad luck. That's it. Now, if it's not, then that's, that means it's you and you got to work on you. But really, the reason for any losing trade should be simple, bad luck. Yeah. Yeah. And when you understand that your like win rate is lower than 50%, let's say, I think you're more comfortable to have losses. For me, at least. That, that's how I feel. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm trading a very low rate. I'm, I'm testing a very ro uh, low win rate strategy now on live accounts. And um, that's right. You actually get... Um, this is something that we've talked about on the... Uh, uh, you're, you know, Hugh Kimura, right? Um, yeah, Hugh Kimura from Trading Heroes. We have a podcast, Truth About FX, um, Truth About FX podcast, and we talked about that on the on the podcast. Like, you know, as you lose and get used to losing and get used to the idea of just rolling the dice, it's easier and easier. If you have a thirty percent win rate strategy, it actually becomes sooner. You know, after time, it becomes easier to lose. Yeah, yeah. and that's right. But it feels so good when you win, right? Because you get these massive winners in a in a system like that. It feels awesome. So it's great. But again, the focus should be on the execution. So you should, you know, you should reward yourself by taking yourself out to a nice dinner if you have eight successfully executed trades, even if they're all losers. You should reward yourself. You're doing what you should be doing, and the results will come later. Powerful, powerful. So how can people find you if they want to connect with you or reach out after the podcast? Um, yeah, Truth About FX is a podcast that I do with Hugh. And there's another podcast called Two Traders. That I do with Darren, and Darren's a, a really interesting trader, one of the most unique traders you'll ever run across. Um, so we talk a lot about psychology in there. And Truth About FX podcast, Hugh and I take questions. So we get questions from traders, and we basically expand on those questions. So that th those those are the best places to to connect really with me. I mean, we do have a small community of traders, but we're not taking anyone in right now. So um, that may may open up in the future. But right now, I would just say go to the podcast. There's hundreds of episodes there. If, if you like this kind of thing, if you like the psychology, the two traders is for you. If you like general trading questions or you want to give us a question, you can do that for Truth About FX. That's where I would send people, yeah. Nice. And those are very like down to earth and realistic podcasts, not like fancy stuff and marketing. So I like it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Etienne. I, I really appreciate what you're doing too. Like your stuff is awesome too. The way, the people that you've had on here, it's amazing. It's, a, it's quite a, um, an honor to be here and I really appreciate um, you're giving me the opportunity because you've done something really cool and I'm, and I'm glad that this is out there for traders. Thank you. And what kind of goals do you have for the future? Um, my trading goals are probably just to learn how to live with losers. So, um, and what this means for me is trading the low win rate strategies. This is something that I've been working on the last, you know, 15 months. Um, and so I really like this. And also I, I've, become semi-automated as a trader. So what that means is I make the decision to make the trade and then I the EA does the exit for me, right? So that's the I'm getting to that point now where I'm I'm getting more and more um, comfortable letting uh cuz I'm <laughs> you know uh, before there was no way I would ever say anything like this, but I'm actually getting more and more comfortable letting the EA manage the exit of the trade 
and I'm happy just to, to come up with a reason to buy or sell. So I decide when to buy or sell based on the pattern, and then the EA will, t will exit the trade for me. So that, that's really my goal is to not take exits anymore. No more manual exiting of trades. <laughs> cool. And what's your motivation to stay in a trading game? I don't know. I love it. I mean, I, I love, I love the. Uh, I think I love like the psychology and the and the probabilities. Uh, two things that I studied, you know, in when I did went into graduate school, I studied um, th um, thinking about your thinking, <laughs> which which is called metacognition in psychology. So I studied metacognition, thinking about your thinking, and how you can teach people to think about their thinking. And the other thing I did is I did a graduate minor in statistics. So that was all about probabilities. Um, and, and that's really what trading is. It's probabilities and it's psychology. It's thinking about your thinking and, and trying not to overthink things, right? So that's what I love. I love that there are ways to get better at trading, which are pure psychology, you know, seeding your subconscious. I love that. And I love the fact that trading really boils down to probabilities. Probabilities is the first piece, the positive expectancy, right? Your system has a positive expectancy. And then the second piece is psychology. You, are you actually executing your strategy as you should? So that's what I love about trading. It's like my two things that I love so much, you know, statistics and psychology. And it's, that's what it is. So I, I don't, I don't really want to stop doing this. I love it. I love, I love the idea of testing new strategies. Of course, most of them end up being, you know, they just, I just throw them away. They don't work in the end, but you never know, you know, you might find something that's, that's good. And, and so when you do find one of the, you know, one out of 20 that, that looks good, it's fun to push it through the process, through the back testing process, forward testing process, and just let it slowly grow up. It's like having a child grow up, right? You have this, <laughs> this idea, and then you back test it in Forex Tester, and then you forward test it in a demo account, and then you forward test it in a small account. And as, as it grows up, you just, you, you know, you get, become really proud of your, of your little child, so to speak. So yeah, it's, it's a fun process. Yeah. And I, I guess you didn't expect this when you started 17 years ago. No, no. I thought, see, like most traders, I thought it was about cracking the code. So I, I, um, when I moved to Australia and I spent that year sabbatical just reading technical analysis books, I, I went, got these books through interlibrary loan <laughs> and they came from all corners of Australia. And I had a lot of books on GAN, you know, and for whatever reason, I thought if I could, if I could crack the GAN code, I could just, you know, always win like GAN did or whatever, you know, and it's, it's the same story, right? You're focusing on the wrong thing. You're focusing on win rate. You're focusing on trying to, um, you know, unlock the secrets of the universe. And maybe that's possible, but it's not necessary. You can still win two out of 10 times and make plenty of money and compound your account. So it's not important to be, to have that 98% win rate. It really isn't that important. Cool. And Walter, I have one question I ask all my guests. If you could give me one piece of advice for traders in one sentence, what would that one sentence advice be? Um, the one sentence, that's a great question. I would say, that it would be a question. Yeah, it would be a question. And the question is this. Do you know if your system has a positive expectancy? And do you know what your subconscious beliefs are? That, that's what I would say. I would ask that question. Because if you can answer that question, then you know all you need to, to create a path to success. That's it. Great, great. Good, good reflection for sure. So Walter Peter, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much, Etienne, and thank you for everything you do with Desire to Trade. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.